So acceleration, to me, I think, is the most important thing in basketball, right? When you hear about people having uh, any, any complimentary thing you say about players, it really comes down to acceleration. You know, he's got a good motor. He has a quick first step. He recovers fast on defense. It's not about how quickly you move. It's about how quickly you can change your speed. So um, there's different kinds of acceleration. You could think of positive acceleration as increasing your speed as LeBron James beginning a drive, right? That's a burst of energy. He's, he's got a strong first step. He's accelerating, going from zero uh, up very quickly. But there's another kind of acceleration, the negative acceleration. That's a guy who's running really fast and then stops, right? Why is he stopping? He's setting a pick. He's in that picture, but he's kind of you know, off the picture. That's not what we tend to focus on. It's probably Chris Bosch setting the screen. He's just, the photographer doesn't think it's even important to include in the, but it's an important kind of acceleration. There's positive and negative. Throughout this paper and all of this research, I take the absolute value. I take the absolute value. I don't care whether it's positive acceleration or negative acceleration. What I'm really interested in is the change in speeds, the bursts of speeds, those critical points when people change, direct, change speeds. Now, when we talk about speed, we have natural ways of measuring it. We know feet per second, or which can translate into pretty easily into miles per hour. That we have a sense of what's fast, what's slow. But with acceleration, there's not really anything like that. In cars, we talk about acceleration going from zero to 60 in two seconds, three seconds, 20 seconds, whatever you're driving. Um, that's not really that useful a metric when you're talking about people. You know, how fast does LeBron James go zero to 60? I mean, it's, who, who doesn't make any sense. But there is one form of acceleration for which we all have very intimate experience throughout our lives. That's the force of gravity. So gravity is pulling you all down into your seats right now. That's one G. Players very rarely accelerate faster than one G. If they did, they'd you know, go up to the moon. The one time they do accelerate is when they're jumping, right? So they're dunking or taking a jump shot. Then they accelerate vertically greater than one G to free themselves from Earth for however brief of time. Laterally, however, they very rarely accelerate one G. What they do tend to accelerate is some fraction of it. So a useful metric, a useful unit is the DG, the DG. So 10 DG is one tenth. Each dg is one-tenth of a g. So if we measure it in that context, then the numbers become like reasonable numbers that we can think about. So um, for example, centers. This is using 2011, 2012 NBA data from uh, Stats, Sports View, Optical Tracking Data, XY Data. Centers, if you look at them, they accelerate between 1 and 2 g about, what is that number, like 11, 12 percent of the time. Of all of the data points for half-court sets, which I'll talk about how we define that, the centers playing, they tend to be accelerating about 11 to 12 percent of the time between one and two decigees. Overall accelerating between one and infinite number of decigees, one or higher, centers on average accelerate about 27 percent of the time. That means 73 percent of the time, 70, whatever is left, uh, they're not accelerating. When you're not accelerating, you're not necessarily just standing still like a goofball. You're, you're, you're inertial. You might be standing still, but you might also be running at a relatively constant speed. So this is not velocity, it's acceleration. Now let me tell you, let me read some of these names to you. So on the left is pictures and the names of some of the people who are the most frequent accelerators per position. So you can see overall by position, centers tend to accelerate, positive and negative, the absolute value, they tend to accelerate more frequently than, say, point guards. That doesn't mean they're faster than point guards. It's not velocity, it's the acceleration, how often they're setting picks and bursting and so on. So if you just look at overall who are the most frequent accelerators, you'll get a list of all centers. But if you look per position, then let me just read you some of these names, and you think of this uh, a team of the most frequent accelerators, who would win against the least frequent accelerators? So who are some of the most frequent accelerators? Tyson Chandler, Joel Anthony, Chris Humphreys, Carmelo Anthony, LeBron James, Paul Pierce, Kevin Durant, J.R. Smith, Kobe Bryant, Ray Allen, Dwayne Wade, Darren Williams. It's not a bad team. Now think about the infrequent accelerators. Listen to these names. By the way, this doesn't mean they're bad players. It's just a different style of play. Uh, Marcus Camby, Marc Gasol, Tyrus Thomas, Marcus Morris, Matt Bonner, Chandler Parsons, Danilo Gallinari, Courtney Lee, Shannon Brown, Daquan Cook, Gary Neal, Derek Fisher, Kyle Lowry. You can sense there's a different kinds of, there's obviously the more dynamic players, the perennial MVP candidates, they're all frequent accelerators. Um, we can also look at this on a team basis. So last year, we can look at each team, how frequently was each team accelerating in half-court plays, which we'll talk about how to define that. Last year, in 2011-2012, the least frequently accelerating team for the entire season was Houston. 
the Houston Rockets only accelerated on average about 18% of the time. So most of the time they were not accelerating. The most accelerating team last year, surprisingly enough, was the old, decrepit, barely moving Boston Celtics. It's, they, won't, they won't win in a foot race against the Rockets or other people. They're not much faster, but they are smarter and they play, you know, they, they change directions faster, or at least that's their style of play. Bear in mind, um, this is only within half court plays. So different teams that may be lower or higher on the uh, frequency ratings, this is only half court plays. So if Houston Rockets runs more fast breaks, for example, that would uh, change the, they may accelerate, obviously they accelerate more in the fast break situations. Now the, the width of the bars here represents the amount of data I have. So we, we have, there's optical tracking data from stats for Houston, Minnesota, San Antonio for the entire season. But some of them, so that's why those bars are thick, but some of them are very thin. So c compare, for example, Boston and Cleveland. They're very thin lines, but for different reasons. Cleveland simply didn't have the optical tracking data installed in their court, in their arena. So uh, the only data we have is when they happen to play at Houston or at San Antonio or at one of the places where we have the data. Boston does have the optical tracking data installed, but they didn't share their data. So again, the only data I have from them is when they happen to play somewhere else. So that's why those two are thin. But nevertheless, there is enough data to be able to, to look at it. Look at those numbers on the right, the frequencies. Uh, the 78%, less than one decigy. 78% of the time, people are coasting. They're inertial. They're not, of all the data points within half-court plays, if you look at people, are you accelerating right now? Most of the time, they're not. Acceleration is rare. And even higher acceleration is rarer still. So you can see it drops down 13%, 5%, 1%. At this point, you might say, what are you doing wasting our time with a 1% thing? You have no data for it. Well, that's not quite accurate. We have 60 million data points. And even at the 4 to 5 decigees at 0.89%, 1% of 60 million, we still have 600,000 data points. Down. It was still plenty of data, still plenty of data. So here's the methodology. So if you remember, last year, 2011, 2012, happened to be a lockout shortened season, unfortunately. It was a 66 game season. There's a total of 1,074 games played, or 1,075 if you count the All-Star game, which we don't. Um, then from that, we take the optical tracking data. The stats has only for, we only have the data, they only have the data that they shared for 233 games. Uh, let me show you what those games look like. So this is all, every game last year. Uh, both uh, regular season and playoffs. So you can see everybody played for at least five months and some people also played in May and June. And in June there was only four teams left remaining and then obviously there was two, then one. Um, green means you won that game, red means you lost that game. All of the games within that month. Um, th these are 1,074 games. Here are the games for which we have the data, the brighter green and reds. So some of them you can see we have from the beginning, some of them we have all home games starting from a little later, and some we just have their away games. That's all we have. It is what it is. All right, now from those games, now I don't want to look at all of the plays. I don't want to look at acceleration for fast breaks. I don't want to look at acceleration during out of bounds plays. I really want to focus on um, set plays. Why? Because the ultimate question that this is building a framework towards answering is execution efficiency. If you can imagine, you have a list of all of the kinds of plays that might have happened, and for each play you have all of the times they ran that play, and you have the trajectory of each player within that play, then you can see how much that trajectory changes each time. If the guy is running the same play in the exact same speed at the same time and is hitting his marks, that's excellent ef execution efficiency. But if he's moving around that variance, that's what would be interesting to measure. So to, that's the ultimate goal, that's the execution efficiency. But to back up from that, we have to do a lot of preliminary work. The first step is we need to just look at half court plays. What's a half court play? So I define it as uh, nine players are on one half of the court, it doesn't matter which half, and the tenth player dribbles over, right? This is if someone's walking it up, let's run this, you, whatever, right? Two, whatever, whatever play they're running, this is a set play. Um, once we filter for those, we have about 30,000 half-court plays. From there, we can calculate the accelerations, express in the decigees, that's where we get the 60 million coordinates. How do you calculate acceleration, by the way? So you have the X and Y position of each player. You'd see where he is now, where he is a frame later. There's 25 frames per second in this optical tracking data. Um, that, the difference would be the velocity, or you can calculate the distance, the Euclidean distance, and the, the second time is another distance, so you see how much the velocity is changing over time. You do a couple of differences like that. 
run some moving averages to make sure you have, uh, to minimize the noise. From that, we could do the offensive defensive comparison, the performance metrics. That's what we've seen the top players in the teams. Now, we want to do some kind of language specification for plays. How do we describe what a play is? We, there's, we can't just say each play is different because, you know, if a guy's just standing one foot over, it's not a different play. It's the same play. We'd like to somehow reduce the dimensionality of the data and, and put them into appropriate buckets. For that, we need to do some sort of cluster analysis and simultaneity analysis, which I'll talk about now. And from that, ultimately, we'd have a taxonomy of plays, and the future goal would be to automatically classify all of the plays that we see into these types of plays and look at the player variances to see efficiency. And this could be done, obviously, both for offensive and defensive purposes. You want to see how efficient your defense is as well. This would be the right approach to do. Right now, I'm focusing only on offensive. So where do people stand on the court? This is a histogram, meaning a probability distribution that's higher where there's more people more of the time for all plays this, and for all kinds of acceleration. So ignoring acceleration, where do people just tend to stand? Well, you can tell in half-court plays, coaches have got the message, you need a player on each wing three. Right? You, got, you place one guy in one corner, one guy in another corner, they basically stay there. And then there's some acceleration in the middle and around the paint. And, uh, sorry, this isn't acceleration, this is just positioning, where people happen to stand. Okay? What would this look like if we only look at the positions of players who are currently accelerating. Let's say accelerating at more than five decigees, one half of the gravity. Where would they stand? What do you think it would look like? Turns out the biggest difference is the wings go away. There are no accelerating players on the wings. They're not just you know, fidgeting. They're, what are they going to do? They've, they ran there at not a very accelerated speed. Now they're standing and waiting for a pass. Most of the acceleration seems to be happening in the painted area, around the lane, around the key. You know, so that's what we need to do is a cluster analysis to see where are the, these key points, or these uh, broad areas. So these, whether it's three or four or five clusters, each of these graphs compares on the left-hand side all points, all positions, and on the right-hand side, just the accelerating points. So think of the, look at the red one. Uh, I'm sorry, the left one. Uh, there's three clusters on the left, and you can see the, the, green, the green cluster on the left, that's where people are on the wings, right? They're always on the wings for all, for all points. But on the right part of the leftmost half court, it's a different cluster because there's nobody on the wings where people are accelerating. They, they seem to be more like in the paint and in the key, and it's a different, they're different proportions of clusters. Looking at these overall, we can come to the conclusion that really there's probably about six major areas where people accelerate from. Now, these are accelerations that include bursts to the basket and also pick sets, so positive and negative acceleration. Um, so there's three on each side, basically the paint, the top of the key, and the wing. A play is more than just one person accelerating, right? It's not just everyone clear out and LeBron does his thing. There's, there needs to be some sort of simultaneity. I accelerate at the exact same time as you accelerate. Maybe you're setting me a pick at the exact same time that I'm using you as a pick, right? That's simultaneous acceleration. That would really be the key to defining when the play is happening uh, together, or what kind of play it is. Uh, so let's look at the kinds of how often simultaneous acceleration, simultaneous bursts happen. It turns out if you think of a burst of just a minimum of one decigee, the bare amount of acceleration, how often is it that nobody is accelerating even that bare minimum amount? That's that little red line sticking out in the top left pie chart. Basically never. Basically never. There's always somebody accelerating at least a little bit always at least one person. But when you start looking at two decigees and three decigees and four decigees, that red uh, wedge grows larger. That means there are times, and about a third of the time, when nobody is accelerating more than four decigees. People are just relatively standing, everybody is just kind of standing around. What else grows? The, uh, the dark blue one grows also from uh, very small to larger. The dark blue one is exactly one player is accelerating. What is that kind of play if exactly one player is accelerating? Until it's also about a third uh, in the bottom right pie chart when, for substantial accelerations. That's an isolation play. That's four people who've le really just cleared out and made room for LeBron or whoever to accelerate and do, do his business. And everyone else is standing still, or at least inertial. Um, the other wedge is the light blue wedge that's also increasing, but then it stops increasing at about three decigees. It actually starts going down. What is that wedge? That's for exactly two players. How often is it that exactly two players are accelerating at the same time uh, at substantial acceleration speeds? That's a two-man game. That's when three players are kind of are coasting, and now you're playing a pick-and-roll or a pick-and-pop with just two players. And you can look at the same thing for the three players and so on. 
By the way, simulta simultaneous doesn't literally mean within the, frame, the same frame. It couldn't. If, if you look at within frames, the probability of two people accelerating both more than four decigees at the same exact 1 25th of a second is virtually zero. So you need some sort of moving window. So what I've used here is one second or 25 frames. What is the likelihood of every rolling 25 second window that at how many people are accelerating greater than four decigees within that one second? So maybe I started a little later, but you know, we still overlapped. We were close enough within a second of each other. So I'll talk about the example on the left in more detail, but first I want you to just see that the simultaneity, that's a half court play, and at the bottom is a time series of the acceleration of each player. And you can see when there's a, a large collection of accelerations together at the bottom where the 1.0G is, is highlighted, people are accelerating together. That, that's the key aspects of the play. So let's talk about this one in more detail. This is the, uh, the last assisted field goal for Oklahoma City in game five of the Western Conference Finals last year against San Antonio. Um, the, the play starts with, the play is basically James Harden dribbling over the half court, dribbles around a little bit, he passes to Russell Westbrook and he cuts away, Russell Westbrook gets the ball, drives, shoots, scores, great. Uh, but actually there's a lot more going on and if we, this is an example of how you would use the language specification to reduce the dimensionality of the data. So how would you do it? So let's start with Thabo Falosha. So he's number two. He's just standing in the corner. He's very easy. He starts in the right wing. He stays in the right wing. He's there the whole time. Trivial. Great. Easy. Now, by the way, each, so each of these rows is intended to mean happening at the same time. And that doesn't reduce the generality in any sense because you can always add another row. If someone needs to do something together, or one person needs to accelerate whatever else waits. So that can be done. Um, let's look at Kevin Durant. So he starts up uh, at the, the left key. What the picture you're seeing now is closer towards the end. Um, he drives from the left key to the left paint, then to the left wing, and then he waits in the left wing. Okay, that's pretty straightforward too. Harden, right, start in the right key, right key, right key, just dribbling, and then cut off to the right wing. Serge Ibaka has the most circuitous and most, most accelerating points. Uh, he, he's moving all over the place. He starts in the left paint. Cut, goes up to the right paint, comes over to the right key, and comes back to the left key. Very busy guy. Meanwhile, Russell Westbrook is just kind of waiting in the left key, waiting in the left key, waiting in the left key, gets the pass, drives to the left paint, that's it. This is the whole play. This is the whole play. The yellow section is where they're simultaneously accelerating, and you can see it on the bottom of the, uh, the time series. That's when people are doing it together. And it might seem as if it doesn't really matter, but it does. The, um, the, Ibaka is setting a pick for Westbrook at the same time that Westbrook is using the pick, and Harden, though it looks as if his acceleration is kind of irrelevant, he's accelerating away, it's actually very important. He's drawing away Ginobili, it's, it's an important part of the play. That's the basic idea. Um, one other point I'd like to make is, uh, whoa, that's not the point I want to make. Is that for, for, for looking at this stuff, an important thing is to look at the, uh, uh, the interactivity. Uh, this is still an exploratory phase. You can't just look at acceleration as numbers. It, there needs to be a way to, to play with these things together, to go back and forth in time, to see what's actually happening. Um, you know, and it's not just offense. You can add things like the, the refs and the defense. You can look at who the players are. These kinds of tools are far more useful than just any kind of tables and charts, right? Imagine if you're a coach or something, you're looking at these. Where's the defense? Where were the refs at the time, right? So there they are. You can see everything moving together. And what was the acceleration at each time step? Um, and you don't have to just look at one play. You can look at several different plays. Obviously, the next play and the final play is a San Antonio play. Um, you can look at everybody going back and forth. So I think this kind of, a, uh, using the spatial data, X, Y data, you, ha you have to have the interactivity to, to really understand what's going on and to find new patterns. So to conclude, I think the future research that I think would be interesting to do and, uh, would be the ultimate goal is to make this execution efficiency pr uh, stuff and look at the plays and the variance of each person's trajectory. But another thing, it's possible maybe to look directly at the relationship between acceleration and, say, offensive execution. For example, so we have all these half-court plays, and we know how they ended. And we can use either a binary thing, it was a made or missed field goal, or we can use something like a shooting percentage, or the points scored, or the expected points scored, something to express how successful this particular play was. Each play lasts about seven seconds. On the, and compare that to the acceleration frequencies. If you accelerate more frequently, does that impact that? If you accelerate from certain locations, does that impact? And if you accelerate simultaneously, does that impact that? Or you can look at acceleration and winning directly, but there you have to bear in mind that some teams uh, move 
have less or, or more half-court plays than others. So you have to take into account fast breaks and uh, secondary breaks. And the final thing would be acceleration in health or injuries, right? We used to think that people just have a certain number of years that they could play. Then we thought maybe it's number of games or minutes. But maybe it's the amount of acceleration, right? And if you can measure for a person, and you can, uh, how much they've been accelerating recently in the past few games, past few weeks, and if that's higher than normal for them, or if it's just accumulating to a large number, maybe it's time for them to take a break. Maybe that there's some uh, work there. So I'm happy to take questions. Please come to the, uh, to the middle, and there's a microphone here. What correlation with any data that you collected was on success of scoring, defense, or winning games? Or winning games? Um, I haven't looked at it directly. Uh, that, that's one of the things that that's one of the things that will be the future research is to look at that direct relationship between acceleration and offensive execution or defensive results. Um, for teams, uh, I, I have I have seen some things for the team averages, but uh, it's worth thinking about more because I didn't incorporate the fast breaks. So really, this, the idea here is to build the taxonomy so that we could build the future place. Other questions? OK, great. Thank you very much. Thank you.